<laughs> Y'all know what it is. You should have never cried. I should have never lied. That night in Jackson, I should have come clean, told you everything instead of all this acting. Like who I want to be Instead of who I really am It's hard to be open Baby, I'm broken And I was terrified If you'd have ever known You'd have been gone Before the next sunrise You were so put together even my mess is a mess. Hey everybody, welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is Drew Smith. Drew is an award-winning professional songwriter and country artist based in Nashville, Tennessee. He is the owner of Grey Sound Recording, working as a producer and senior mixing engineer, and the creator of the Before You Record course for new artists. Drew's work has been recorded in many countries, including the U.S., Canada, Ireland, Germany, and Australia, among others and recorded by legends including Merle Haggard, Nashville Powerhouse Randy Hauser, Rob Snyder, Jason Charles Miller, and many more. Here for a conversation about the state of music for indie artists, making a name as an independent, the creative process behind writing and publishing, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Drew Smith. Hey Drew, how are you, man? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, we're uh, we're thrilled to death. Uh, we talked a minute before the show about just how excited Mike and I get for the musical guests. So, so thanks so much for doing this. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's great. Um, the last country artist we had uh, was actually uh, Todd Henry, and uh, he's no longer a country artist. He's an author. So uh, it'll actually be good to work with someone who's currently in Nashville and has been down. I was going to say, Mike, you should you should have probably have blown us up a little bit more and told him that you know the, our last country guest was you know the late Johnny Cash. It was it was a really deep interview. We had a long time to talk to him, but you know it was uh, it was great. So it's been good times. So <laughs> no, anyway, so cool. So let's just kind of get started at the beginning, Drew. Let's talk a little bit about your career, how it got started, and and where things sort of I, I guess began for you. Man, I was I was young. I, I mean, I came from a very musical family on my mother's side. Uh, my father's side was all farmers, mechanics, that sort of thing. But my mother's side, very musically inclined. So I kind of grew up around that. And then uh, I really got serious about playing guitar probably around age 10. And shortly after that, probably by age 12, I started, you know, writing things down in notebooks and just really got focused and fascinated with the process of of songwriting and um and it just took off from there man it just never left me i couldn't shake it you know i'd get in trouble at school for you know doodling stuff in my in my notebooks you know lines and song ideas and that sort of thing and making chord charts and all that (laughs) And uh, I just, it, it's just, it was just in my blood, man. And so I just stuck with it. And uh, I, I tried to do other things. I was terrible at sports. I mean, like really bad, really, really <laughs> bad at sports. So I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't make the basketball team or track team or anything else. And so I just, uh, you know, every day after school, I'd go home and just lock myself in my room and play guitar and, until, uh, until I finally went to bed. And, uh, you know, by the time I was 24, I was doing it full time, dropped out of school halfway through my sophomore year of high school, um, ended up going back and getting my GED a few years later, went to a little community college, uh, got my EMT license, worked on an ambulance for about four years and then, uh, and then took off into the, the music business just as hard as I could go. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, and it's so funny. There's this, I guess, behind the scenes thing that people don't think about a lot, you know, and obviously you're an artist who performs and tours and does all that as well. But this songwriting side of the business, I think is really interesting. And it's maybe something people don't see that much, right? I mean, when they're thinking of the Taylor Swifts out there, I mean, the people of the world that are these giant megastars, I mean, most of them don't even do their own writing. And so, you know, there's such a, 
I guess, kind of underground scene of these people who are just expert writers of songs. And, you know, they end up being amplified by some some bigger star or whatever, but it's such a cool thing. And so I love that you explore, you know, discovered so young that it was something that you were into because uh, I, I think that it's, I don't know, for me, it's almost cooler than being the guy that goes and performs, you know, being the one that, oh yeah, no, I'm the one that made the magic for that person. It's not them. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I think the... I, th- I think that there for years has has been this uh, misconception that, you know, anything that you hear on the radio was written by whoever is singing it. And and that just hasn't you know, that's that's never really been the case. I mean, in the days of Hank Williams and Bob Wills and guys like that, I mean, it was that was more accurate. Taylor Swift is a great example. I mean, she's a phenomenal writer. She you know, but she's had co-writers for years. That's not to take anything away from her, but she loves to collaborate with other songwriters. And um, and then you've got artists like George Strait, who almost, you know, uh, who is arguably the biggest, you know, country star that's ever lived, uh, at least in the top five. And he's, you know, he's not hardly written anything that he's ever recorded. Yeah. And it, it doesn't take anything away from anyone's artistry. Um, and it doesn't take anything away from from writers. Uh, Liz Rose is is a great example of that. She wrote a ton of that Taylor Swift stuff with Taylor, especially in the early days. And Liz Rose will tell you very quickly that she is um, a really bad singer. And when you go see her perform live somewhere, uh, you realize that she's a really bad singer. <laughs> And nobody cares because she is a phenomenal songwriter. She doesn't need to be a good singer. She had Taylor for that. She's had all these other artists that she's had hits on for that. So she can sit at home and be a bad singer all day long, man, and nobody cares. That's great. Um, why country? Is that just kind of like, as a kid, what you listened to and you, what you fell into? Or is, is it kind of just... Uh, you started in a rock band and ended up in country. Uh, tell us uh, why you went down that road. Man, my parents listened to a little bit of everything, which I think was great. I mean, Jackson Brown and the Eagles to Merle Haggard's Don Williams and the Guns N' Roses records, uh, Tom Petty, Steve Earle, you know, Dolly Parton, Amy Lou Harris. So like all of these different all these different uh, genres and styles of music. They listen to so much stuff. And that was great for me, but I think I really stuck with country. The first band that I was in, I I don't know, I was probably, I think, 12 or 13. uh, And I use the term band very loosely. (laughs) But we were were a punk rock band, you know, and and we played Green Day and, and stuff like that. But that was what was... That's what was super cool at the time. Yeah, I think everybody gets one of those. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But at the end of the day, man, I'm originally from Tennessee, so uh, I'm a hillbilly. And if I, try to, if I try to do anything outside of country music, it just sounds like a hillbilly trying to sing other types of music. Okay. So, so, so you're I just stuck with what I am, you know? So you're a Tennessee native. Um, which means that you're kind of like you're OG in Nashville. You're from there. Um, what I'm a I'm a unicorn, Mike. <laughs> uh, there's not many of us here that, <laughs> that that are actually from here. That's what I was going to go down. How have things changed over the last little bit as far as like Nashville scene? Like, um, a it's I'm sure things have changed a lot just due to COVID. But over the the years from you know like growing up as a kid to now what's different so if you can imagine like a third of la just moving to nashville that's pretty much what happened <laughs> i'm sorry so, like, okay. i mean they're all moving to utah where i'm at too and idaho as well where mike's at so so uh, we can sort of empathize but we don't have the cool cities like nashville or austin or any of these other places that are being overwhelmed by californians right I don't know, man. I was just in Utah and Idaho uh, a few months ago, and man, those are beautiful states. Uh, I was asked not to come back to Idaho. I'll have to tell you guys that story afterwards. But um, I do need but, to hear that story. 
<laughs> but man, it's, you know, it's been wild to watch it grow since the time that I was a kid. So I grew up uh, an hour and a half south of here. My family, we came to Nashville all the time. Um, we'd come up for a weekend and just, you know, kind of piddle around as as a as a family. And I remember the 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 football stadium being built. Uh, I remember when it was just an industrial area. And then all of a sudden there was this big hole in the ground and then I I remember watching them erect the the stadium over you know a couple of years time, uh, and I think they're getting ready to redo it now, which is is crazy. It doesn't seem like it's been that long ago that they that they initially built it, but the city has changed a lot. Um, you know, pre pandemic, there are a ton of companies that have moved here. Amazon has moved to town. Uh, they struck a deal with the city, I guess, a couple of years ago, and. They came into town. There's some huge uh, health networks that have moved to town. Um, HCA is the name of that one. They've brought a lot of jobs uh, into the city, which is which is great. Um, but yeah, the the culture has certainly changed. It's not it's not just a bunch of good old boys and girls anymore. It's people from all over the country. It's people from all over the world. Really, I had a guy knock on my door. I don't know, like 30 minutes before I, I hooked up with you guys and he's from Germany and he's looking for an internship, you know, so people are coming here from literally all over the world. Well, and uh, I think one of the big problems or one of the big complaints out here in the West anyway, and I assume it's the same thing in Nashville is that these people come from California or in your case, all points, right? Germany or wherever, but there's a handful of them that don't really want the culture. They were escaping taxes or they were running from, you know, the uh, lifestyle they couldn't afford or, you know, whatever. But they're not looking to become, you know, someone from Nashville. They're not looking for the culture that existed in Nashville. Rather, they come and impose their will on it. And I think those are the select few that are ruining it for everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great point, man. And I'm glad that you said that because I've noticed that even people that weren't born and raised here, people that moved to town even re really Ryan, just like 10, 12 years ago have said to me, you know, this is not the place that I moved here for. We came here from wherever because we loved the, the culture here. We loved the history. We loved this, we loved that. Everyone was so nice. Everyone held the door for you and said, thank you. And yes, ma'am. And all that. And now it's not that anymore. And they just got here, you know, 10 years ago. So it has really, really blown up in the past five years. So I've seen a lot of changes, man, culturally and, you know, architecturally as well. The skyline has completely changed and that's, that's weird to see. Um, and, and they call it progress and I guess it is man, but, uh, I, I've never been big on change. We got to embrace it. I guess we don't have a choice, but man, I, I do miss, I do miss my old home. I miss old Nashville. Yeah. See, I I'm from Seattle. And uh, I'm one of those guys that moved to Idaho that left Seattle because of the stuff that's going on there. I used to play at a, a venue in, called Fornos pretty regularly. And uh, Amazon came and bought the building and shut the venue down. And now it's, it's a place for working at Amazon. And, and it's like slowly over the years, same thing kind of happened in Seattle where it just grew and grew and grew. Now you can't afford the rent. You can't afford this. And, and, and every streets told you know if you're trying to just drive to bellevue now it costs four dollars just to drive on the road that used to be free and that kind of stuff just it, it's not the same place that i grew up in and it's changing and it's it's something that kind of you know it is what it is there's nothing you can really do about it and and um you know looking it's a good place to visit but i i can tell you one thing's for sure my stress stress level has dropped immensely moving from Seattle to a place like Idaho. And uh, um, then maybe I need to come to Idaho then. <laughs> well, they'll let you back in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I can get a pass back in. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to maybe circle back a little bit and, and just sort of keep digging in a little bit on, on Mike's earlier question about why country. So one of the things I think so many people struggle with, and especially, you know, performers, people who are trying to make a, a living as a professional, you know, singer, songwriter, you know, dancer or whatever it is you're trying to do so much about that, career leads people to live a inauthentic life, right? And so, but you made the point that, hey, you know, I'm a hillbilly, I play what I know, this is what works for me, right? And I think that the best songwriters and the best performers are the ones that can actually 
you know, are, are basically evoking themselves in their music. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about just sort of finding your authentic self and being willing to stick to it versus, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you can write a good country song, you could probably write a decent pop song or a decent whatever, you know. So so what keeps you in your lane? And, you know, how does that sort of relate to you as a human being? You, you know, man, a, a town like Nashville, there are a ton of temptations to chase the radio, what mm -hmm. we call it. And... If, if you're chasing what's playing on the radio, if you're trying to write that, then you're already behind. And someone said that to me pretty early on in my career. And, and, and I'm glad that they did, because as a result of that, that was just one of those things that always stuck with me and that I always try to keep in mind and was like, you know what? I'm not going to try to write what's on radio. I'm just going to write what I know. And maybe it'll be ahead of the curve. And that hasn't that hasn't failed me yet. You know, some of my biggest some of my biggest successes, man. I got um, I got my first gold record on uh, uh, an artist named Randy Hauser. It was on the album How Country Feels, and that album was number three in the country uh, on Billboard, which is a, a huge accolade. We Taylor Swift's Red album uh, was just beating the stew out of everybody on the charts that year, um, which is fine if you're going to be beat by anybody. <laughs> Taylor's a good one, but um, you know the that song on that album. That album had four number one hits on it, and it was extremely commercial uh, and very well done. But it was very commercial. I mean, it sounded like the time. And the song that I had written had everything against it. It was a ballad. It was four minutes long. And it sounded... It, it sounded um, like something you would hear in the 90s. It sounded like a 90s country song. And so when, when I wrote it, I thought, man, nobody will ever record this right now. You know, we've got like pop tracks and stuff on the radio basically so nobody's going to record this and i was wrong and and it was because i just wrote what i felt that day and and what i thought this song called for and i still i mean to this day man i still have to i really have to work to stay in my lane and and do what i feel is right for the song and and if if it sounds like a patsy klein song then that's fine I'm not going to try to change it to to make it sound like the hottest, coolest, hippest country artist that's on the radio right now. Uh, if it turns out that way, that's great too. But if it doesn't, it's just I don't put that kind of pressure on myself anymore. Um, and I do believe it, you you <laughs> you you said the word, man. You nailed it. You know this this authenticity thing. People, for whatever reason people can hear right through your BS. Yeah. 100%. Musically, you know, and that's, that's phenomenal to me that, <laughs> that that's the case, but people know it when you're being inauthentic. Yeah, no, it's true. Well, and I mean, as it pertains to life, business, whatever, right. Whenever we're trying to be something we're not, you know, you, I think you, you'd keyed in on exactly what it is, right. You write what you know. And if you're busy faking it, right, if you're pretending that you know what it means to be a, a teenage girl in love or something, like, I mean, it's probably going to come off a little inauthentic, you know, versus, you know, if you can talk about, I don't know, not being too, too uh, hillbillyist or whatever, you know, but something in the backwoods or whatever, you know, that probably feels a little more yeah. natural to you. Well, like, like for me, you know, growing up, I would listen to Mark Wills. I would listen to, you know, Tim McGraw. I would listen to you know, like don't take the girl, the, 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 yeah. the songs that, you know, like the good classic country songs. And now I turn it on. It's like a hip hop song mish, mashed with a pop song. And I'm like, what are you trying to do? This is, this isn't <laughs> like, I, I turn on a country station and I leave because I, I don't enjoy the current state of, of the music. And yeah. I think it's been that way for a little while, but there are, don't get me wrong. There are good artists out right now and there are good quality, talented you know, good songs out there, but it almost seems like they're trying to blend two genres of hip hop and pop and put them together and call it 
country hop or whatever it is going to be. You know, it's just like, <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> so I guess you're alluding to the, you know, the country classic old town road by little Nas X, well, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> classic so, country. And, 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 you know, not, not to like degrade on, you know, it's an artistic choice. It's their style or whatever it is, you know, props to them. They got a song on the radio, but me personally, if I'm going to pick a country song, if I'm going to, you know, like, watermelon crawl like that to me i like that yeah. that old stuff like i dig it it's like that's what i'm into and maybe i'm just an, an old fart but um you know i i truly appreciate a good story in a in a country song and that's why i would listen in the first place and so i i love that you've worked with guys like merle haggard and, and those yeah. you know a, a legit good country artists and and i and i can appreciate that so yeah yeah, that's that's been a cool thing to me, man. That's been something that uh, I've really taken a lot of pride in is that I've been able to work with some of my heroes, that what I was doing was enough to get their attention, but still have commercial success. And, and really, that that's not something that I planned on at all. I've just been I've been very, very blessed to be able to to kind of live in, in both worlds. Not everyone gets to do that. But again, for me, instead of shooting straight for what's on radio or just or getting up and trying to write uh, a song that sounds like Don't Take the Girl, doing that has just never worked out for me. I just try to get up and write the best song that I can that day. And whatever it sounds like, it sounds like. And, and I let it be that. Yeah. Do you mind, can we carry on just a little bit further down this line and talk just a little bit more about the process of actually getting a song sold? So, I mean, a big part of what you're doing is you're writing this music, and it sounds like in your case, you're just writing the music that you care about. But I'm curious about, like, what that process looks like. Like, I mean, do you perform it and then sell it? Do you write it with an artist in mind? Like, how, how does that process work sort of from, you know, the drawing board to the uh, final final sale? Yeah, no, so, uh, I mean, you know, you you show up, into these these writing appointments with other songwriters and you do these co-writes and you just kind of write whatever's in the room that day usually everyone has a we all have everybody used to you know carry around notebooks and all that and that's before my time but now everybody just keeps lines and ideas in their phone and so we just kind of toss those around back and forth until we land on something that, that everyone um unanimously goes oh let's let's write that i want to write that and so we do that and then um we make a you know a shoddy uh recording on our phone and turn it into our publisher and um the, you know those those guys these creative managers and these people at at these publishing companies they have a much different ear than we do i've i figured that out early on uh, they know great songs when they hear them and, uh, and it takes all kinds, you know, they, they're in that position because they can't write songs, but they know what a great song is and they, and they know it immediately. I'm not in an A and R position or a creative management position because I write songs. I don't know what's great or not. I only know what I like. So if they think that it's something that would appeal to a major label artist, you go and you demo it in a studio. Uh, you get it sounding as close to the radio as you can, you know, as far as quality. And then those creative managers or song pluggers take those to the major labels and pitch them and say, hey, I think this would sound great for Tim McGraw's new record or Blake Shelton's new record or Carrie Underwood's new record. And then from there... Um, the powers that be at the record labels, if if they love it and they agree and they think that it's something that would be great for Blake Shelton's new record, then they go, yeah, I'm going to keep a copy of this. I'll play it for Blake. They play it for Blake, and if he if he digs it and he wants to record it, they call you and they say, hey, we're we're gonna we want we want to put this on hold, which is basically them asking um, for you to not play it for anyone else in town, because you know typically you're planning albums out six months to a year in advance so it's going to be a while before they actually record it so there's always kind of been this understanding or this level of respect that if someone is that interested in recording it they'll call you and say hey we want to put it on hold don't play it for anybody else 
because they, they have the, you know, they're afraid that someone else is going to hear it and beat them to the punch. They'll record it first. So after that, if, if it makes it into the studio, then basically they just, as far as like selling songs or anyone buying songs, they're really just buying the license. You know, the songwriter and the publishers retain ownership of the songs. Uh, these, these record labels and these artists are only buying a license to record and perform them. And that's pretty much it, man. That's that's kind of the rundown of how it works. So the music industry has changed over the last 20 years, uh, a lot since the advent of, you know, the MP3, Spotify. Um, sure. These kind of platforms, you know, you're not really putting out a CD and pushing the whole album anymore. It's kind of switched to singles. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are you... I, I know that um, there's a lot of a lot of controversy on Spotify as far as like the the play count. Like if you buy an album from an artist, that one album represents like a hundred thousand or more plays on Spotify, just monetized wise. Um, as someone who's putting out music and someone who's uh, writing songs and working with you know labels and stuff like that, how do you think? things are going to go from here on out. Like, do you think it's going to, I mean, I, there's, there's so many different variables. What, what are your thoughts on just the state of the industry and the state of, you know, a record label? I don't see record labels being as prevalent as they used to be. They used to be the, you know, if you wanted to put something out, they would fund the studio time. They would produce it. They would do all your tours and all that stuff with you. Um, and now it seems like the 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 only benefit that they give you is um you know um they might have, be able to open some doors on tours and and stuff like that but they're they're going to come and take like a 360 deal and take all your merch and all that other stuff so that almost doesn't seem fair either so i guess what are your thoughts on the current state of of music in the industry well mike you sound as nervous about it as the rest of us yeah. uh, <laughs> We're we're all freaking out because we don't know what what comes next. I mean, it was man, it was like when iTunes happened, things started changing and they started changing fast and uh, across all genres, across the board, man, the, the industry as a whole. I'm sure the same way that the film industry changed as soon as Netflix happened mm -hmm. uh, and the red boxes, you know that used to sit outside gas stations and McDonald's and stuff like that, where you'd go and put a dollar in and take a DVD home. That was a weird thing. Yeah. You know, I when you think that about actually. that, actually, I did too, man. <laughs> I, I really liked it, but it's to, at the time it seemed really cool, but in hindsight, and I guess it was really cool, but in hindsight, it was a weird, uh, such an odd, odd concept, but I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, man. I don't know the answers and I'm not sure that anyone does. I will tell you this. I, wholly blame the industry for the state that we're in monetarily because as soon as the Napster thing happened years ago, which I, man, I was just a kid. I mean, I, I don't remember a lot about that, but I, I do remember that it made headlines and there were these, you know, all these controversies about, you know, Metallica got involved and sued a bunch of individuals you know, regular people like us, man, they were, <laughs> they were suing them for sharing their music. But when Napster happened, the, I think half of the people, at least upper management, the guys that are making big decisions in, in the industry at all these labels, I think half of them, uh, turn their back and, and just, Oh, well, you know, and just, uh, ignore it and it'll go away. And I think the others just panicked and didn't know what to do, but no one did anything. And here we are getting paid, you know, 0. 0.0008 cents per play per play, which is ridiculous. It's asinine. Yeah, it's wild. It is, but no, no one got ahead of it and they had every opportunity. And I, and again, I don't know what the answer would have been then, but you know, it, it got to the point where uh, at satellite radio, I heard somebody one time say sort of, well, it all started with satellite radio. Well, 
that's not accurate at all. Satellite radio has always, you know, taken pretty good care of artists and songwriters as far as what they've paid. That wasn't the issue. Streaming was the issue. When when we started being able to cherry pick songs from albums instead of having to, you know, go to Kmart or wherever or Best Buy and and buy a whole album, that changed things as well. You know, that was kind of the beginning of the end because all of a sudden you're you're not making a twelve ninety nine sale for an entire album. Yeah, you're making a ninety nine cent sale. Yeah, as I yeah. recall, that was the big innovation with iTunes, and and part of what made it blow up so big is that people could just buy the single tracks, right? In those early days, we didn't have like subscriptions where you could just stream anything you wanted. Back then, you had to buy tracks individually, but that that was a big shift from sort of the the old way of doing things. So uh, so that was a big one. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, though, too, I mean, so, OK, obviously the the executives of the world figured out how to not pay anybody for these streams. Right. And it's unfortunate because this is the way that we do music these days. It's it's funny. You just mentioned like Kmart and Best Buy and stuff like that. I mean, I was just having this con- conversation with my oldest son, who's 15 the other day. And uh, and that was part of our discussion, because all he knows are a million singles by a million artists he loves. Mm-hmm. Right. But he doesn't know what it felt like to go to the store and, you know, you only have 20 bucks so you can pick one. And, you know, there's three that came out today, but you got to pick the one. And then, you know, you get to open it up and you look at the artwork and, you know, who they thanked, you know, am I in there by chance? Maybe they know me, you know, I mean, like, you know, there's just this whole experience that used to happen with music. And I think it, it drew people closer to musicians. I feel like now there's this, I don't know. and, And I think that this is, you know, to the rest of my point, I think that this is an expansion of what happened with streaming services and all that stuff. Basically, record deals were really bad back then, <laughs> like when Napster started and things like that. I mean, it was good for Metallica, but it was bad for a lot of small guys, you know, a lot of up and comers. Yeah. And they were taking, like Mike said, these 360 deals where they take a piece of everything you touch. And in a lot of cases, you would get a record deal and you'd end up owing them money when they dropped you. You know, like, I mean, yeah. they were just bad deals, right? So the industry's already all, always taken advantage of the talent, which I think is, is a problem in itself. But one of the things that came that I think anyway is a positive is, and it's sort of what I'm saying about my son having a million different artists that he likes and, and is, is sort of the accessibility of being able to put out whatever you want, whenever you want, whoever you are. And we were talking about this again with the same son the other day, because he's really gotten into this, uh, you know, group called Spider Gang and this rapper guy, Little Darky, that he just loves. And this guy, you know, they're, they're putting out all this music all the time. But like, you know, when I was a kid, like when I started working with the record label that I I used to work with in 98, they they would send me a a crappy demo they recorded in their garage that was like done with like a tape deck in the same room while they played, you know, it was like just horrible, right? So you had to listen to this thing and try and figure out, you know, from the roots of it, is it any good? But now, I mean, a demo sounds like a studio track and every teenager is working on Pro Tools. And like, I mean, so all these yeah. guys, you know, and so, but I think that that is sort of an outgrowth of that Napster movement, right? When, when streaming became a thing, well, that opened the door to the world. Like all of a sudden people could express themselves in ways they couldn't, you know, through the, the old way of doing business in the record industry. And so I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about just sort of your experience in that. I mean, obviously you sound like you're, you know, you're a little bit younger. You, you probably, you know, you weren't involved in the pre-Napster days as much. But, um, but afterwards, you know, I mean, obviously access to technology, access to, you know, streaming platforms, things like that has certainly probably given you some opportunities out there too. Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, it's, I've been real blessed that my accolades as a songwriter have kind of helped me as an artist. I mean, I mean, really, I put off putting out content as an artist for years because I was being, you know, I was having success as a songwriter, and um, and I I regret that. I wish I would have put out my own stuff earlier. But you know, getting ready to do a, a full album that's coming out this year and going to radio with it and tons of huge plans for that. But I do think that I think it's a great thing, man, that you can you can be 16 years old and have a subscription to Pro Tools for 30 bucks a month or whatever it is uh, and sit in your bedroom and create. I think that's an awesome thing. I know that creating, you know, when when I was a teenager, kept me out of a ton of trouble. Got me in some trouble, too, probably, (laughs) you know, sort of chasing women and that sort of thing. But. You know, uh, I think it's wonderful that that that's there. I, I think it's great that anyone anywhere can put out a record if they want to. 
And I think that as a result of that, I think there's never been a better time to be an indie artist or an indie band and be on your own and, and not worried about having to go out and, and get the attention of, you know, some record label exec. I think that's great. The, the difficult part about that though, is that what comes along with, with doing that and breaking through all of the noise, because there are so many putting it, I, I read a stat not long ago about how many, how many new albums come out on Spotify every day. And I don't, uh, I won't even try to re guess the number. I, I don't remember because I saw it and I went, oh my God. Like <laughs> it, it was unbelievable, man. Yeah. And so to break through all of that noise really takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And so much of what we're doing now is social media driven. And so now and you guys, have, I'm sure you guys have seen the memes and stuff like that, probably from artists that you love, because it has it's in the recent weeks, it circulated a lot. But it was like, you know, this this big thing. And I forget if I forget who wrote it. I should be ashamed for for not remembering this. But it was an artist and she was saying, you know, I, all I wanted to do was was be an, an artist and a songwriter. I never planned on having to be a social media expert or a marketing expert or a content creator. I'm not a content creator. I don't know anything about that. And I have no desire. I just want to write my songs and go out and play them for people and make people happy and do what I love. I don't know anything about all this other stuff, but I have to do it now, whether I know anything about it or not, because now that's part of the job. And I read that and I was like, my God, man, she nailed that. That yeah. That's correct. Yeah. And as quickly as those things change, algorithms and all that, man, it's constantly changing. That has become the full-time job. Yeah. If you, if you really want to make moves as an artist, even if your stuff is great, that's the thing is like, even if you're really, really good, if you're writing really great songs, if you're recording really great stuff, it sounds just like, you know, a, a full blown, you know, quarter of a million dollar budget album, you've still got to break through all of that noise. And that, unfortunately, it takes more than talent to do that. Now, it shouldn't, but it does. And so now you're all these other things, you know, yeah. you are your A&R, you are your label, you are your publisher, you are your marketing expert, you are, you know, your distribution, all of that stuff, man. I put yeah. out a new single in at the end of October. It was my first single uh, towards finally doing, you know, what I really want to do as an artist. And man, I've been in this business a long time and I have, uh, I mean, I've actually been in the business. This is all I've done full time for uh, 14 years, but I've been, I've been a, a signed songwriter for 12 years. And so when I started, uh, I used TuneCore to distribute my stuff for this single. And to do that, to get on all the platforms, Apple and Spotify and this and that and all these other things and YouTube music, all that, uh, all of the stuff that goes along with that, I just, I didn't even know, man, all the administrative parts and pieces of it. And it was like, well, you know, to get it on this, you got to do that. And you got to have this ISRC number. And, you know, what, what is an ISRC? Like, what, what is going on, you know? Yeah. And just very uneducated about that. I hate to say that, guys. I really do. But, you know, I, I, I just, I didn't know. So it's like, you know, you're a businessman and you're, you're an admin and you're in all of these other things as an indie artist. So it's an uphill climb. But I still think that it that now is the best time, better than it's ever been, to be an independent artist or independent band away from a record label. Because just, just like Mike said, they're going to own you all the way around. They're going to own your publishing. They're going to own your merch. They're going to own your masters, the, your likeness, everything. And it's... You know, you used to be able to swing deals where record labels used to not care about your publishing. They didn't need to own your publishing. They were making enough money off of record sales 
that they didn't care about that. So if you said, well, I want to keep my publishing or I'm writing for this publisher over here, they go, cool. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Do, do you, man, do whatever you want. We don't care. We don't need it. Yeah. Now they need it. Well, yeah. No one's buying records. Yeah, no, And now they need your merch. Yeah, your merch and your tour, uh, you know, whatever you're getting to, to play a venue and, and just every other living thing. Yeah. So, um, you, uh, you also own a studio. Is that correct? Do you, you do recording as well? Produce easy. I do. Yeah. I've got, I've got a studio here in Nashville, uh, um, Is, that I've, I've been at for a couple of, couple of years now. And I'm sorry, did you say something to the mic? Yeah. My internet's bad. I apologize. So, um, yeah. Like ah. Well, maybe um, I can, I can ask. I, I was just, I think Mike was trying to get into, you know, you are a studio owner out there in Nashville. You know, do you mind talking a little bit about the experience of sort of starting that? I mean, it's ostensibly a, a small business, right? It's an outgrowth of what you do for a living. But, I mean, you know, it's also a business in and, in and of itself. I, you know, what's it like running a studio these days? I, I love it, man. I it's To me, it's great. I love creating and I love helping others create. And I love, um, you know, navigating that ship, especially for people that haven't had a lot of time in the studio. Man, yeah. that's so rewarding to me to help them navigate all of the ins and outs and of of that and to give them, you know, a heads up of what to expect and what not to expect, what to be prepared for and you know all that stuff, man. And and it's also when I'm working with other artists, I'm not too close to it. It's not something that I've written myself, right? So I've got some distance from it. I'm a totally different set of ears than they are and so you know, they they might hear it a, a totally different way than I do, but there's a chance that the way that I hear it um, might be a little more accurate to how it should be just because they are so close to it. Cause I find the same thing, you know, with things that I write, if I try to produce it myself, I, I can really get myself in a mess. I always love having someone else involved in it because they're an outside perspective. Yeah. I was just going to bring that up. I've, I've actually, I, I went to school for recording arts. Um, I um, had aspirations of opening a recording studio at some point. It, uh, at some point it's going to be something I'll do just for fun. Um, but working with other artists and being that, um, that outside source, I mean, like lots of times you'll be working with people and don't even realize that they're out of tune. And just being able mm -hmm. to tell them, hey, you know, um, can you tune up your guitar or let's do this. Let's maybe think about maybe changing the course a little or doing this. Just having some sort of a, uh, an outside ear, an outside perspective that's, like you said, not right on top of the song or have played it 300 times and thinks it needs to be exactly like this. A small change here and there makes a big difference sometimes that they don't really notice or or haven't been through the process to know that they could do minor tweaks just to change a few things here and there. And um, I would love to, you know, just be involved in, in some of the, the stuff that you've been a part of just because I'm sure there's, there's times where you're like, Oh my goodness. Like, I can't believe we just recorded this and I can't believe how good this sounds. And going from this scratch track that they just brought in or like, Hey, check this song out to having this polished product that, that you can deliver in hand to them. That's just gotta be a really cool feeling. So, um, yeah. it really is, man. I was uh, telling someone in an interview yesterday, they were talking about, they were asking me about that feeling when you go from just a scratch track to all of a sudden, you know, it's this, this body of work and, and what that feels like and to watch it happen in real time. And I said, you know, I don't, that's something that, I don't think you ever get over, like you never get used to that. It's it, it, every, every time it's magic. Every time it happens, you know, yeah. and it's, it's just crazy, but by far one of my very favorite things about that. Yeah. Is, is hearing where it started and where it's at now and, and being able to hand that off to somebody and go, look what you did, man. Well, and I just wanted to pile on Mike. This. He, he wouldn't admit it, but you know, Mike is a, a pretty good DJ and uh, I, I remember, I mean, there's been numerous times, you know, because I've been around him his whole DJ career, 
where, you know, he'll put some just, you know, insane mix up, mash up together, or he'll, he'll just do this awesome set or whatever. Everybody will sing his praises, but he'll be the first one to take a dump on, oh, well, I missed that beat somewhere or whatever, you know. <laughs> so, so, you know, having that ear, you know, and especially the ear of somebody else can be so valuable, either for, you know, not killing yourself over that one beat that you missed because nobody heard it anyway, or, um, you know, having somebody there to catch you, you know, when you see those things so that it's not, all on you so you're not tearing yourself down as an artist or performer (laughs) yeah man you know i think as as musicians for whatever reason we're just like i think we're just inherently self-deprecating yep and i i'm not i'm not sure why but um i was working on something with my girlfriend last night and and uh Be careful this is a show for all audiences right so I mean, right. Everyone, I mean. yeah. i'll send you the video uh, <laughs> i was working on something with with my girlfriend last night and and I, I i just immediately she was like as soon as we finished she's like that's great i was like no it's not it was trash i'm trash everything i'm doing is trash my existence is trash <laughs> she thought it was hilarious but it was like that's how that's how we view things and one little thing it's off if we know it then it just destroys everything she's seen me after shows i'll i'll just i'll be all but throwing things you know and everyone else thinks it's a great show and i'm i'm off in the corner somewhere on my own talking bad about myself well i think think it makes us better man well and i think there's something to it you know it's the same thing that you see in stand-up comedians or you know anybody who's like a high achiever or whatever it is they do that whole you know holds themselves to a high standard anyway is, um, you know, I mean, you almost have to be a little bit damaged, you know, you, you can't be too refined, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions, you know, the people who had the, the perfect upbringing and the perfect whatever, and then became a, a huge success. But I think that, you know, a lot of the, I don't know, the grit, the, the whatever it is that you find that makes an artist attractive to you, whether it's, you know, the pain you see in the brushstroke, or it's the, you know, the whatever you hear in a lyric or, or whatever, the, that bit of artistry comes from someplace inside you. And I think that if you're a little too spit polished, it's hard to get that out. I agree, man. Yeah. You, you damaged is the right word for it. Yeah. We're, we're definitely damaged in some way and everyone is, but I think, I think I've always been one to kind of cling to that damage because I've always recognized that there's something about that. There is something about, holding on to it and i know nothing of letting go uh there is something about holding on to that that um that has always just kept me inspired as as twisted as that sounds you know i i think and i think we see it with artists as well man when when they um when they get married and they have kids you know like they'll have a few albums out that were just phenomenal just great records and then they get married and they have kids not blaming not blaming a wife and kids on anything but they get happy Mm -hmm. (laughs) things get going just a little too well (laughs) and then all of a sudden they're making stuff that we're not really that into anymore yeah yeah no it's funny you know because there's a lot of artists i followed sort of their whole careers right and you see that happen you know they, they sort of get to an age where all of a sudden i mean you just you can't write that same thing that you wrote when you were 19 and pissed off you know, yeah. now things are pretty good. You have a 401k, you have a pension, you, you, know, you, have, right. you know, you're, uh, you're getting something, you know, a little kickback from royalties or something. Things are going pretty good, you know? And I mean, not to go too dark, but I mean, you know, and you see this in it with like, you know, the, the artists who end up committing suicide and things like that. When mm-hmm. as an outsider, you look at these guys like, uh, you know, Chester from Lincoln park or, or, uh, yeah. uh, homeboy from Soundgarden, Chris Cornell, you know, you look at those yeah. guys and you go, oh, my God, you had everything. Like, how, how could, everything. you know, I mean, you've got the money, you've got the family, you've got the people, you've got the, you know, the whatever, right? And it just goes to show that at the end, I mean, that, that person who was able to manifest that little bit of damage into a whole career of just singing these, you know, heart-melting songs, you know, they, they're still that person. They, they have some money, they have, you know, all these things, but they're still, whatever was wrong with them in the first place is still wrong with them. Yeah, yeah. And you guys being from... Uh, are you both from Seattle? Is that right? No, just Mike. Uh, I am. Mike he's, is, he's from Idaho. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Mike, you being from Seattle, I mean, that, that was, that's Chris Cornell territory there, yeah. man. And, yeah. and uh, he was such a phenomenal artist. Uh, it's it's crazy to think that he's gone 
and there will never be another like him. But I've I've read and and watched a lot of stuff about his time in Seattle and creating those early Soundgarden records and his voice being so powerful that he was, you know, literally just, you know, burning microphones, like $5,000 microphones, you know. Uh, uh, he, go on. I, I'm very blessed to have been able to grow up in that time frame in that part of the world. That was an amazing time for music. And, and the the music that came out of Seattle in, in, the, in the 90s was just incredible and i wish i was old enough at the time to go to the shows and be a part of the shows and, and actually see it live but just yeah like although i will say it was i mean it's been a few years ago now but mike uh treated me to a pearl jam concert in seattle and uh and that was maybe the coolest place i'd seen him a couple other times in other places but there, there was nothing quite like seeing them there before and, uh, I mean, just, I don't know, coolest thing, right? Just, I mean, in the air. And, you know, uh, Eddie Vedder is singing lyrics that he's just tweaking a little bit to talk about the Seattle Supersonics or whatever, right? You know, it's just like enough, you know, this is fine-tuned for the people of this city, you know? And, uh, and uh, so even though I came to it much later, and, uh, you know, obviously the, I, I grew up with that music in the sense that I listened to it all as a kid, but I, I didn't, you know, grow up in the neighborhood. To eventually, as an adult, see that, uh, you know, in Seattle, was a, it was a game-changer. Man, that's got to be magic. Uh, I mean, I think it's like going, you know, for Nashville, it's like going and and seeing someone at the Ryman Auditorium or, uh, you know, the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. It, it is. There's a thing about, there's something about seeing and hearing that in its origin. Yeah. That's just, that can't be replicated anywhere else. Well, it's almost like a, family of 10,000 people <laughs> you know it's like yeah it's, it's their music it's their show it's their artist because he's from there it's it, there's something yeah. about it you know it's just um well, it's like any sport or whatever right when you're playing in front of the home team you know there's this extra whatever this extra secret sauce on top that is the you know the, that's a great the blood point, or man. The passion or the ghosts of of these kids you know or in our case of these adults who are now all grown up it's the ghost of our younger selves that wanted to see Pearl Jam as a 17 year old <laughs> you know, so that's that's a great point. I, I haven't thought about that, but that is uh, that is you know pretty much apples to apples. There's there's that home that home field advantage to it, for sure, man. It well, does add something. I mean, like the the show that we saw in Seattle, that was the end of their tour, and that was their hurrah for the the last show for the tour. And so, I mean, they're of course they're going to pull out all the stops it's the last show on the tour and and it's also their hometown their own fans and people that truly appreciate what they do um not well, saying for, that you know for people like me too that traveled in you know speaking of the secret sauce or this hometown advantage i mean for me seeing it in seattle added 20 percent to it right i mean i could have seen them here in salt lake city but i believe you know, that and yeah. i've seen them in salt lake city you know and they were great and I you know all the that. things you would think right but seeing them in Seattle just adds this something. And, you know, whether you're from there or not, like Mike's saying, I mean, it really does create this sort of unified family of people who like, you know, whether we like each other personally or politically or whatever, we can all unite on this. Like, this is the one thing that we've all got in common. For sure, man. That's what a great experience. I'm glad that you guys got to do that. That's a cool thing to see Pearl Jam in Seattle. Yeah. So um, do you have... I mean, I'm sure you have millions of stories of playing shows and doing things, you know, just anyone in the, in the industry has stories that just blow minds of people. Like, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe I met this guy. I can't believe I did this for, I, I want to focus on you as an audio engineer, as someone who's, who records things. Um, for me, I, I love recording live shows. Um, I think there's a different energy in it. I think a studio session for one thing, you know, it's polished. It's supposed to be pristine. It's supposed to be, you know, the, what goes on and airs on the radio, a live show there's stuff can go wrong. Stuff's going to happen. Things like, but I also think you get the raw elements of the performance that comes out in a live show that wouldn't come out in the studio. I've heard of uh, recording engineers that will actually set up monitors in the studio to give them that live show feel to try and capture that energy. 
Um, do you have any recordings that you have done that stand out to you as like, this is my favorite session. This is my favorite artist. This is my, my go-to for like, if I were to put something in a portfolio to demo me as a recording person, this is the, what I would put in there. Is there anything that stands out in your opinion uh, as far as that goes? Man, that's so hard to answer because I, I've, I've been real blessed to have had a lot of great moments like that. For me, it's, it's really, instead of it being, you know, one particular thing, uh, I think it's just been a collection of times when you knew that it was right. Yeah. And, and yeah, I work with a ton of, uh, studio session players and it's it's the guys that are playing on all the hit records that are out right now you know it's the a-list guys yeah. and so they're they're great on their worst days most of the time we get what we need in one or two takes but there have there have been times when we've we've you know had to had to do six or seven takes on something but man you just know it everybody knows it. It's not just something that I feel or my assistant feels or, you know, whoever's playing guitar that day, like everyone knows when that magic just happened. And it's crazy because it's, you realize it when it's happening and it's like, everybody tries to get real still and Don't pretend that up. it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's almost, it's hard almost to enjoy it. Um, I rolled over my headphone cable and nearly hung myself. Um, <laughs> it's it's almost hard to enjoy it because you're so worried about doing anything other than just continuing to do whatever that magic thing is, just letting it happen. You know, so it's like you you kind of have to harness it until it's over and then celebrate it and, and then feel it. Um, man, there's been so many of those instances I, I worked with a guy i did a record on a guy named jay edwards a few years ago just the letter j last name edwards and it's this kind of bluesy americana just a really gritty j sounds like no one that i've ever heard before in my life um he's he's this blend between like joe cocker and chris stapleton but he's not either of those things and we had this great record put together and we recorded it at a couple of different studios here in town. And I remember how magical every one of those recordings were. And it was because and it was the same thing with him. I brought in all the A-list guys. I brought in Moose Brown, who um, is, is a phenomenal songwriter. For one, he's, he's always been a great songwriter, but people mostly know him. Uh, as a pianist, uh, he plays. He's played for Bob Seger for years, and just played on a ton of stuff. Jimmy Buffett, and just you know, so many different people, um, and and tons of you know, the rest of the band was like that as well. Just major accolades, and everyone recognized that this guy was special. That he just he had a different thing without even trying. And he's one of Jay is one of those guys that he talks just like he sings. You know, it's never it's never two different people there. He he when he's speaking, he sounds, you know, if you hear him speak and then you hear him sing, you go, Oh yeah, I could have guessed that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Just a just a beautiful voice. But I think everyone recognized how special he was. And as a result of that. I think everyone's approach was a little bit different than what it would normally be. Uh, not to say that, you know, they don't try as hard on other things, but Jay just, he brings something to the room, man, where you just go, my God, this guy, this guy is so good. I don't want to do anything that's going to distract from what he's doing. And so you just dig in and you just you you play as well as you can or you you know you you push buttons as well as you can and you, <laughs> that that whole thing and to to watch that entire project go down the album is is named cold and um it's one of the it's one of the best projects i've ever done and maybe will ever do 
uh, just because it was, there was just so much magic in it. Yeah. I, I recently, um, just for fun, I mean, it, it was towards the end of COVID. And, um, I hadn't done anything audio wise. I haven't, I hadn't really had any gigs or recorded anyone for a while. And so, um, I, I went and I set up a PA system at an open mic and, uh, just to, more more for anything just to be able to record something and mix it down and practice and 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 have that experience again and uh this guy showed up his name was spike coggins and he's a one one piece guy he's he's got a little um he plays a banjo he plays a harmonica he's got a little washboard drum underneath him and his set was phenomenal and coming out of a you know the COVID situation and not having anything and, and being able to go and do this show. And it's just a little open mic, but the way the audio turned out and the way that the, the, the just everything about that was, was just a really cool experience. And, and, it, and I love when shows like that happen when unexpected, like really talented musicians come in and just rock your world and like, Holy crap. Yeah. I can't believe I got that on mic. That is like so cool. And um, I, I'm sure you have countless stories like that, and I hope to have many more down the road. But, um, yeah, I, I can awesome. relate with that. And, and just having that musician or that, that person that's so in tune and so in zone and be able to just leave it all on the, on the floor, is, it's, you, you can't replicate those situations. And, and, you, uh, you really can't, man, and you can't replicate that feeling either. I yeah. mean, there's, there's not a drug in this world that feels like that feeling. Yeah, I was I was telling someone about that the other day and they don't you know, it's like there's. When you have the show and then and it everything just goes and it just it's the perfect crowd, the perfect environment, you have good, good audio, good lighting, this and everything just when when something like ha that happens, I have to leave. I have to go on a walk and just kind of like take a breath, take it in, feel it like, holy crap, that was amazing. And, and I don't think you can replicate that high. I don't think there's a way no. to do it. There's just something about it that just when, when you have that show or that experience, even as a, you know, I've had that experience as a fan, you know, like I, I yeah. didn't perform, I'm sitting there watching them perform and I vibe off of their energy. And, and there's just something that, that music does to that. Uh, if there's any other kind of like you're not going to get that at a at a football game or whatever instagram all that stuff i'm probably easiest to reach on instagram but uh man i love hearing from people i love uh i love when people give me a heads up that they're coming to town and um if there's ever anything that i can do for anybody to to help them out because it's uh it's big city, small town, man, and, and there's a lot that goes on here, and it's easy to kind of get lost in the madness of it and try to figure out which direction to go. So anytime I can point anyone in the right direction, I love doing that. So please reach out to me if, uh, if you're going to be in Nashville or if, just if you have any questions about anything. I'm happy to answer those as well. Yeah. Uh, I apologize for my Internet issues, um, but I really enjoyed our conversation today, and thank you for making time for us. Yeah, man. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's appreciate. been amazing. So uh, thanks so much to, to Drew, to Mike, and to everybody who listens to the show this week and every week. And we'll see you all next time. You would have even loved the truth.